Hello everyone, welcome to the first day of the rest of your lives. Just kidding. So, what we're starting here is going to be a long series of lecture videos for this class. Now, we have to start at the very beginning, of course, um, and this is what this one's going to be all about. We'll go over in class kind of like what the structure is for how you're going to use these, and this is one that we'll actually watch in class at the very beginning to set up the process. Now, what this video is dealing with is one part of a whole concept outline that basically takes the curriculum of APUSH and breaks it down not so much by eras, but by concepts. So, um, things that you have to understand that are contained within certain periods of history, and then it's broken down in an outline so it's very clear which large concepts you need to know, and then which specific details within those concepts that you need to know as well. This very first key concept, 1.1.1, that's how it's structured, is pre-Columbian Native American civilizations in North America. So that means that we're dealing with basically all the different types of civilizations that existed in um, specifically North America before Columbus. That means that's where the pre-Columbian term comes from, came to America. So this whole um, historical period, number one, does begin in 1491, so you are expected on the test to be aware uh, of what lives and civilizations were like for Native Americans before the introduction um, of Europeans into the Americas. So here we go. All right, so our very first key concept, you can see it's at the top there, and the way it works is then down to the bottom left for you, you can see that it has a little bit something more specific. I'm going to call that the descriptor a lot when I do these videos because it's outlining what are the extra details that I'm telling you about that will appear in the notes to the right. So you can see our very first one says, the spread of maize cultivation from present day Mexico no northward into the present day American Southwest and beyond, supported economic development, settlement, advanced irrigation, and social diversification among societies. Now that one idea fits into the two larger ideas at the top of the page that I typically don't read, but you are welcome to do so. Now let's look at some details of what this one slide has to do with. So, we need to go way, way back in order to get started, not so much with what's going here, but setting up what got um, America to this point. <clears throat> now, around 35,000 years ago, uh, the world was basically divided, right? So we're in this situation where we have continents in the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. And today, there is no land connection, but there used to be many, many moons ago up at the Bering Isthmus. So today we talk about the Bering Strait, which is um, a waterway, a very thin waterway. An isthmus is a very thin land bridge that connected Asia to the Americas. And what happened is this land was sort of revealed as ice from these ice ages started to melt. And eventually you get people eventually realizing that and migrating in that direction. So this does not exist anymore. Um, and we're going to talk about how that gets closed off and kind of closes off the Americas as well. Now, between 13,000 and 3000 BC, that's when people from Asia started populating the Americas. So you can see that in the map on the top right that we believe life came out of Africa. And because you can see that the connection to the Americas over land was one of the furthest things away, it was one of the last places to be populated by humans. So that's why it has this huge thousand year gap between what's going on. Now you can imagine what that process was like. People would go a little bit further or they need to get away from other people to have resources and they move a little bit further and further and further and that's why it takes thousands and thousands of years. Now it's estimated that eventually 54 million people lived in the Americas um, and throughout the Americas over 2,000 languages and very diverse populations developed there because we're not talking about a short amount of time, we're talking about thousands and thousands of not just years but generations of people. Now when we look at this it's estimated that even if just a few thousand people crossed over the Bering Isthmus before it closed off around 3000 BC, um, those few thousand people spreading all across the American continents would eventually, you know, through, you know, population growth, emerge into about 54 million later on, okay? So that's kind of the background of how we get to the point of humans even being in the Americas. Now let's focus on the descriptor. Maize cultivation. Now that's the big term for here. Anytime the terms are in red, those are things you absolutely have to know because they are proper noun terms mentioned by name by the college board. So 
That's the one you need to know. Things in green represent geography. Things in that light blue color represent words that if you don't know what that means, I'm not stopping to tell you what those mean. You need to look those up on your own. They're higher academic language that I don't have time to define. Anyway, maze cultivation. What we're talking about here is a very specific type of um, cultivation of a crop that really helped the population in certain parts of America grow um, and sort of proliferate to be a large population by the time that Columbus came over. <clears throat> now, maize is just a fancy word for corn. Um, and it was the staple form of nutrition within North America, okay? Now, it was a renewable source of energy, right? So that means that they would grow it, pick it, plant it next season, grow it again. And basically, corn has a lot of carbs, it has a lot of nutrients, and that enabled societies that might have struggled to even subsist before would start to develop into larger civilizations as time went on. Now, part of the reason that this maize cultivation in corn was so successful was the development of the agricultural revolution. Now, before I tell you what that was, notice this term is in yellow. That means that it's still important, it's a proper noun that's good to know, not as important as the red terms, but still very good terms to know. The agricultural revolution happens when humans start to domesticate crops. Now, the way crops existed before mankind started trying to manipulate them to fit their needs, they fit whatever their needs were. So they would have structures within, um, you know, sort of their, I don't know the proper word here because I'm not a botanist, but they would develop in a way that fit their needs to reproduce. Those that couldn't do that would die off. Those that could lived on. So what you get... Um, when man comes over to the Americas is that corn existed, but it looked like this. Not really a lot to eat. Now eventually, where we are today, corn is much larger, has much larger kernels, but this shows you this evolution of corn because of the agricultural revolution. That happens because over time, different strains develop because mankind said, well, this one sucks. I don't want it. This one gives me lots of energy. Let's eat that and grow that again. Okay, so that kind of shows you what kind of what evolution looks like in terms of corn, but because corn developed in this way, that's going to enable many Native American civilizations to develop um, not as fast as what was going on in the rest of the world, but eventually um, leading into developed civilizations. Now, part of the agricultural revolution was also irrigation, which is, of course, mentioned on the left-hand side in the descriptor. Irrigation means not just using the river water to, you know, naturally grow things, but to say, can we divert these water resources to water things in the way we need to use it instead of the way nature is using it? So you can see, it's the domestication of the landscape through crops, through water use, through saying what resources do we have and how can we use that, okay? Other things that this American Southwest saw developed were flash floods and rivers that enabled them to use that irrigation in a way that fit them. Okay. Now, a broad term that we use for the American Southwest is Pueblo civilization. Now, Pueblo is actually a Spanish word used to name sort of their types of dwellings, but it's kind of the broad umbrella term for many tribes such as the Navajo, the Anasazi, the Zuni, the Hopi, which were many of these tribes that existed in the American Southwest today. So think like the Mojave Desert, um, Arizona, New Mexico, even down into Mexico itself today. Now what happened is these people migrated throughout the Southwest and it led to unification and conflict. Now the concept out outline doesn't call for us to talk about the Aztecs or the Inca or um, the, the, you know, all these different civilizations that you probably learned about in seventh grade, but realize that this was a long process of these different tribes and different civilizations competing for land use. But what did they have in common? Pueblo civilization, so living in the desert, trying to use water to grow crops, specifically corn. All right, here we go to the next slide. Now, our next topic for this slide has to do with no longer the area that we focused on before, but instead now societies that developed kind of to the north of that. And that's why I have the map right there for you to say we're no longer in the American Southwest. We are right now in the Great Basin. Now, this is the area that's contained by the Sierra Nevadas um, in the west, the Rocky Mountains in the east, um, and various other geographical features that create kind of this um, area in which it's kind of surrounded by mountains and the civilization is contained. Now, here's about this area. It had a lot of arid 
um, sort of not very useful land in terms of growing crops or use of water like happened in the American Southwest. So because there was a lack of natural resources, these cultures did not develop agriculture. They did not do what we saw uh, in the other ones. What they did instead is they remained hunter-gatherers. Another term in red, so that's a good one to know. Uh, due to the lack of available resources. So because the resources weren't really there for them to harness, to use to develop their civilization, they used what the land afforded them. So they said, what does the land have? Well, we'll just pick berries, roots, hunt the animals that are there, and use that to subsist, use up all those resources that are available in a region, and then you have to move on to somewhere else because you're not growing them yourself. Now, some tribes that fit into this area, the Shoshone, the Paiute, and the Ute tribes, are, um, you can see where the name like Ute sounds like Utah, same area there, what do you know? Um, these civilizations valued mobility over material wealth. Now, hunter-gatherers are nomadic. That means that they move from place to place. And this is very different from our concept of civilization today. Think about it. Um, in America today, around the world, a lot of the things that represent what gives you more status on, in society is what you own. How big is your house? What car do you drive? What type of phone do you have? All these different things. Back then, um, these tribes that I mentioned before did not value that stuff. If you had more stuff or more family members, it's like, what are you doing? We're going to have to move on from this area in a matter of months. Um, the elderly will, were not valued as much because they were a burden. Having too many children was a burden. So you can see how different civilizations had different social um, sort of standards and morals because of the different things going on within their civilizations. And that was what the Great Basin was like. Not a very pleasant place to live. Okay, another great place, we're moving a little bit to the east here, the Great Plains. So this is an area that is defined by the Rocky Mountains in the west to the Mississippi River in the east. Um, what we're going to see is that they were kind of a mixed system. They uh, were hunter-gatherers still. The Great Plains is where the buffalo and the bison, another red term, um, were had a large presence. So that is what these tribes used as their main resource um, for life. <clears throat> so they would hunt the bison, they would use the skin for their dwellings, for their clothes, they would use the bones to make structures because they're very solid, uh, they would use the meat to eat, they would use um, various other elements for ceremonial stuff as well, they would even use the buffalo chips, also known as poop, in order to burn stuff to keep warm because they didn't have a lot of wood to burn um, for fires and for warmth. So you can see, again, using what the land afforded them. Tribes in that area, in the Great Plains, the Sioux, the Blackfoot, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne tribes, some of those names should look familiar. Um, the, the name Cheyenne is the capital of Wyoming today. So you're going to see a lot of these names that tie in with things that are still around America today. today. Now, as you got closer to the river, you find that people tended to be more settled and more agricultural. And I want you to think about that. I keep on saying... People were doing what the land afforded them. So if you're closer to the river, you have more access to water. It was easier to divert that water to create irrigation. So again, that is what is deciding how different Native American civilizations developed their lifestyle. Okay? So this is going to be sort of be beating the dead horse here is environment has a major influence on culture. We talked about how some were nomadic, but they shift to settlements once they come into a geographical region that had different resources that fit the needs of a different type of civilization. And lastly here, you heard me said it about five times before, civilizations subsist on what the land affords them. So that's why there is so much diversity of culture and sort of um, lifestyles in Native American society because they were in a way segregated by geography and used whatever they could get to stay alive. I mean, North America and South America, too, had a much more rugged terrain. And I can talk about sort of the alignment of um, the continental axes to tell you about what determined why it was more difficult for civilization to develop in the Americas um, than in Afro-Eurasia in the Eastern Hemisphere. Ask me about that in class. All right, another region now. This time we're moving further east and further north into the Mississippi River Valley and the Atlantic Seaboard. Now, when you start to get into the Mississippi River Valley, you're dealing with people who um, relied much more 
on the use of water. Why? Because the largest river in America is right there just asking to be used for resources. Okay, so because these civilizations that we're moving closer to in the Northeast have more access to water and more diverse geography, there's going to be more diverse societies. So I want you to look on that map that I put for you right there in the upper right, and you can see there's kind of these shaded regions to show you where different, different civilizations developed. Meanwhile, if we say, well, what was going on in the American Southwest, that whole Pueblo civilization encompasses much more land because it was a much more similar geography. All right, so meanwhile, in the Mississippi River Valley, they relied on the river's resources. Now, a yellow term that's good to know here uh, was the Cahokia civilization. Now, this was a more advanced civilization if we're using like European standards here uh, because the river afforded them many more resources um, which enabled population growth, which meant that their society was much more um, sort of stratified than other smaller tribes. Now, like the Southwest, they grew maize. They saw corn as a staple crop. They also grew beans and um, squash, which I'll talk about a little bit later. They're called the three sisters of crops because they are three crops that provide lots of energy, so carbs in the corn beans you're getting a lot of protein in there and squash has a lot of nutrients that you need to develop um, your health and then as time goes on to sort of develop your um, your tribe into a much more hardy people that aren't just trying to subsist but thriving instead okay uh, with the Cahokia they built things called mounds um, and that's kind of some archaeology we still have from from them today and even cities in a in a sense that they weren't nomadic villages but places where people settled and a very dense population lived. Now because they had higher population density they also had more social stratification so getting closer to classes you know upper class ruling class and sort of lower class more the you know the working class started to develop in this so it shows that that's not some sort of European phenomenon it happens when there are more people when you have fewer people the goal is surviving Okay? When you have more people, it automatically means that there's going to be more stratification Okay, because you have different needs for a very large society. So that's what's going on in the Mississippi River Valley. Um, in the northeast, in the Atlantic seaboard, um, they've got the Great Lakes, they've got the Atlantic Ocean. So that means, again, reliance on water. The word that we use to talk about um, society that was up in kind of the New England area today is Algonquin society. We also had the Iroquois Confederation up in more the New York, Pennsylvania area, and then the Powhatans when you start to get closer down into the Virginia kind of Middle South area. Now, because there were many more resources here, we see farming, we see hunting, we see fishing. So all those other ones we looked at seem to just focus on one of these, right? Maize cultivation for farming for one group, hunting and gathering for like the Great Basin people, fishing for people right on the Mississippi. But when you have more resources, you can develop more means for livelihood and develop more quickly. I mentioned corn, beans, and squash earlier, the three sisters of crops. This helps these societies grow. Okay, And by the way, corn, beans, and squash uh, were crops specific to the Americas, but it did take longer for these crops to be domesticated than other crops around the world due to smaller population and inhospitable environment. Okay, now let's talk about the Iroquois for a second. Uh, we call them the Confederation because it wasn't just a tribe. It was a group of tribes that figured out that there was power through unity. And they said, why are we fighting each other? We should unite. Okay, um, and in fact, in some ways, when we get to our Constitution, the idea of United States was in part inspired by the Iroquois saying, hey, we have all these different interests but we have interest in uniting as well. So the idea of federalism actually goes along with the Iroquois Confeder Confederation. All right, they were a matrilineal society as well, which means that power and possession passed down through the woman's side. So mother to daughter, mother to daughter, rather than a patrilinear society that we see develop um, with the patriarchy over in Europe and many other places around the world. Um, multi-tribe alliance, kind of already talked about that. So what I really want you to get away from this is that look how diverse these civilizations are. They're developing as their society needed to develop. And because there were so many ways of 
dividing areas within the Americas without easy communication. There's tons of language groups, tons of different um, societies for just subsisting, and for some, thriving. All right. Now, our last slide here is getting a little bit closer to home. We're now on the West Coast. Best Coast, here we go. Okay. First, let's look at the Pacific Northwest. So this is today, you know, Washington and Oregon along the Columbia River. Notice I'm mentioning another very important river where civilization developed because water is important, okay? Uh, the broad term for up there is the Chinook civilization. They used limited agriculture um, and were more reliant on hunting and fishing because that's what the land afforded them. So yes, they could grow agriculture, but why are you going to put more work into this source of life when it's easier to go hunting and fishing because there was such an abundance of those resources. They looked at water as a life source, um, and they also had large ships and fishing techniques that were specific to them because, again, what resources were there for them. So we know there's a lot of salmon, lots of rivers, lots of use of the ocean up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, lots of, also very large trees. The trees they would make would be hollowed out um, trees that would then be made into very large ships. Large trees, larger ships than normal. Now these societies, kind of like the Cahokia, were stratified, many different language groups, um, and sort of more of a focus on material culture because they were more settled. When you have somewhere to be settled, you feel safe and secure to start to aggregate things. You're not worried about having to get up and run away and live somewhere else and take everything with you. So they were more settled, so they were more material. Okay, last thing we're talking about here is California. So what's going on in our own state over here? Now, California has a very diverse geography and climate, which means that that's going to develop very diverse native societies all across our state today. You can see that in the map that's over on the right. Um, so what's pointed out over there are different tribal territorial areas um, in our state. And you can see that, um, especially when you get up into the Northwest, they get smaller and smaller. That means that these groups had typically some different languages, different customs, different, um, that customs could be like social customs or economic customs. Uh, they're depending on what the regions afford them. So you can imagine on the coast, um, where there's sort of ample fish and marine culture, those societies are going to be focused on using the ocean. Meanwhile, when you're getting into the Central Valley, there's fertile soil, so they're going to be more um, focused on agriculture, uh, not fishing, because there's no fish, okay? So that's sort of what's going on with us. In a way, we're almost sort of a microcosm for all these different systems because we have a much more diverse uh, geography there. Summing up everything here, combination of lifestyles and innovation and agricultural techniques help native peoples grow stronger over generations while using the land in a sustainable way. Now, what I mean by this last comment is that it did take much, much longer for civilizations to develop within the Americas because of um, an inhospitable environment, of areas being divided by mountains, of climates not being the same when you go sort of down the coast through different latitudes. So eventually, innovation fits those needs, especially in agriculture, but it's going to take a lot longer for these native civilizations to grow strong and have um, sort of, you know, more advanced systems of government and organization to be able to domesticate agricultural. Agriculture took so much longer uh, because oftentimes they were trying to subsist in a land that didn't provide enough resources. So because these uh, civilizations existed for so long, in inhospitable environments, they learned to use only what they needed in a sustainable way where they could come back and they weren't going to use up all the resources. Now that's going to be different, um, a different view of land, a different view of resources when we get past this pre-Columbian era and get into the Columbian exchange, which we will get to in another key concept or two. All right, thank you so much for watching. So this slide will always be at the end of every single presentation you have. And what it tells you is the things you need to do next, okay? Because watching the videos is one part of homework, but doing some work that complements the videos is another part of it too. One assignment, creating terms note cards. You need to make one for each slide of the presentation. Red or yellow terms only. So don't choose the green ones, those go with geography. Don't choose the blue ones because you should know what those mean already. Preferably choose red terms, only choose a yellow term if there is no red term on that slide. 
Now, for every one of these videos, you have a quiz that will be posted through Google Classroom. It's due the next morning, and we talk about it at the beginning of class. You have a geography assignment for every historical period. It's due on the day of the unit test. You have a chronology quiz and a geography quiz at the end of the unit before the unit test. Um, and all the videos that you need to watch after this point are already posted as well, so if you want to get a head start, you can always do that as well. So, this is Mr. Chidola signing off. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in class. Bye.